If you've ever used a hand pump to fill your bicycle tire with air, then you know that with use, it can become very hot to the touch. Frictional heating is minimal because the internal parts of the pump are well lubricated to allow them to move freely. What then is happening? The answer lies in the study of thermodynamics. Suppose we have a closed system, that is, one that has no mass coming into or going out. Next, let us define the internal energy of the system, U, as the sum total of the energy of all the system's molecules. Now, let's have the system undergo some process in which it passes from state A to state B. The change in the internal energy of the system, delta U, is equal to any transfer of heat to the system plus any work performed on the system. This is known as the first law of thermodynamics. For an ideal gas, the internal energy can also be defined as the number of molecules in the gas times the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Note that the internal energy of an ideal gas is only dependent on the temperature and the number of moles of gas. Suppose we have a gas confined in a cylinder with a movable, frictionless piston. The external pressure on the piston is the force per unit area. If the gas is compressed by displacing the piston a certain distance in the direction of the force, and this is done very slowly to ensure the gas remains at equilibrium and under constant pressure, what is the work done on the gas? Try again. Correct. Note that because the volume decreases, the negative sign is necessary in order to follow the convention that work done on the gas is positive. This equation cannot be used directly for calculating the work done if the pressure changes during some process A to B, as shown in a plot of pressure versus volume. In the more general case, the work done is equal to the area under the PV curve. Two kinds of processes frequently occur in laboratory experiments, isothermal and adiabatic. By definition, an isothermal process is one that occurs at constant temperature. For an ideal gas, this means that the product of the pressure and volume is constant. What happens to the internal energy of an ideal gas during an isothermal process? Correct. The internal energy does not change during an isothermal process. For an adiabatic process, heat is neither added to nor taken from the system. In such a case, the change in the internal energy of the system is equal to the work done on the system. What happens to the temperature of a gas during adiabatic compression? Correct. During adiabatic compression, the temperature of the gas increases. A bicycle pump represents an adiabatic process in which the air in the pump increases in temperature as it is compressed by the stroke of the pump handle. The pump exterior is then warmed by the hot air. In looking at a PV diagram for isothermal and adiabatic processes, it is evident that for a given change in pressure, an adiabatic process results in a smaller volume change than an isothermal process. This is because during adiabatic compression, not only does the pressure change, the temperature changes as well. If you place a beaker of ice on a hot surface, it soon melts to liquid water. Heat flows from the hot surface to the cold ice, causing the ice to melt. But have you ever placed a beaker of cold water on a hot surface and seen it freeze into ice? This would require heat to flow from the cold water to the hot surface. Although this would not violate the conservation of energy principle, you know that it would never happen. The second law of thermodynamics explains why. One form of the second law is heat does not flow spontaneously from a cold object to a hot object. The development of the second law resulted in part from the study of heat engines, devices that convert heat energy into mechanical work. A basic heat engine takes in heat from a hot reservoir, converts some of this heat into mechanical work, 
and expels the remaining heat into a cold reservoir. The process of converting heat energy into mechanical work requires that heat flows from a hot reservoir to a cold reservoir. This can be demonstrated by a heat engine consisting of a thermoelectric device which produces electricity to drive an electric fan. When one leg of the device is placed in a cup of hot water and the other is placed in a cup of cold water, the fan spins. If water from both cups is mixed into one cup and both legs of the device are placed in that cup, the fan does not spin because no heat flow is possible. A heat engine usually runs in a cycle, returning to its starting point after each unit of work is done. Because the change in the internal energy for each cycle must be zero, the net work done by the engine is equal to the heat input from the hot reservoir less the heat output to the cold reservoir. The efficiency of each engine cycle is defined as the absolute value of the net amount of work done by the engine divided by the heat input. The efficiency can also be written in terms of the absolute values of the heat input and heat output. Some common examples of heat engines are the internal combustion engine of an automobile and the gas turbine of an electrical power generator. Now, consider an engine that produces a power of 80,000 joules per second, operating at 100 cycles per second, and a heat input of 4,000 joules per cycle. What is the efficiency of the engine? Correct. Its efficiency is 20%. For an engine to operate at 100% efficiency, no heat can be lost to the cold reservoir, which is impossible. This illustrates another form of the second law of thermodynamics, which is, no cyclic process can completely convert input heat to work. A theoretical limit to the efficiency of a heat engine can be determined from the Carnot cycle. This cycle consists of four reversible processes, two isothermal and two adiabatic, performed on an ideal gas in a piston device. A reversible process is one that follows an equilibrium path that can be retraced if the process is reversed. The first step is isothermal expansion of the gas, as illustrated by the path from A to B on a pressure versus volume diagram. The second step is adiabatic expansion of the gas, shown by the path from B to C. The third step is isothermal compression, shown by the curve from C to D. The final step is adiabatic compression, which takes the process from D back to the starting point A. The efficiency of the Carnot engine depends only on the temperature of the hot and cold reservoirs between which it operates. This Carnot efficiency is a theoretical upper limit that can never be exceeded by a heat engine. Suppose written specifications of an engine claim a heat input of 5,000 joules per second at 400 kelvins and a heat output of 2,000 joules per second at 200 kelvins. Are these specifications believable? Correct. The calculated efficiency of the engine is greater than the theoretical Carnot efficiency, which is not possible. Heat pumps and air conditioners operate in a manner that is the reverse of a heat engine. Each does work to transfer heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. Heat pumps and air conditioners operate in the same manner. They differ only in their objectives. For a heat pump, the hot reservoir receiving heat is the interior of a home being heated. For an air conditioner, the cold reservoir from which heat is removed is the interior of a home being cooled. The Carnot cycle can be run in reverse as a heat pump or air conditioner. The theoretical coefficient of performance for such appliances depends only on the temperatures of the hot and cold reservoirs. We know that a temperature difference must exist for a heat engine to produce useful work. When no temperature difference exists, there is no ability to produce useful work. This loss of the ability to produce useful work is related to a property of the thermodynamic system known as entropy. As a system loses its ability to do useful work, its entropy increases. Entropy can be thought of 
as a measure of disorder of the system. Suppose you have a container of gas connected to an empty container by a tube with a paddle wheel. As the gas flows to fill the empty container, it does work on the paddle wheel, and the disorder of the gas increases. Once the gas has filled both containers, no more work can be done on the paddle wheel, and the disorder of the gas has reached a maximum. Thus, the more disordered a system, the greater its entropy. For an isolated system, that is one which does not interact with its environment, the second law of thermodynamics can be stated as the entropy of an isolated system can only stay the same or increase. When discussing a process, such as ice melting to liquid water, it is the change in entropy that is important. For an idealized reversible process, there is no change in entropy. However, for any real process, the change in entropy is always greater than zero.